Hi, my name is Kunal, and welcome to the Geeks of the Valley podcast, which connects with some of the brightest minds globally who are leading their respective industries today to discuss the hottest upcoming industry trends and how their work is affecting the global economy. This morning from Jakarta, Indonesia, we have a serial entrepreneur and the current founder and CEO of Zandit joining us. Please welcome Moses Lowe. Moses, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to have a, a heavy hitter like you joining us on the podcast. So thank you so much. And uh, let's jump into the first question here, shall we? Sure, let's start. So tell me about yourself and your background and how it led you to really founding Zendit, where you've really gone on to raise $80 million. And the company has really become a core part of the payment system in uh, Southeast Asia. Sure. I was born and grew up in Southeast Asia. Uh, parents, one side from Indo, one side from Malaysia, born in Singapore. So kind of all over Southeast Asia. And then spent time in Australia and the US studying and working. Uh, throughout that time, I was lucky to have some pretty important milestones or, or points in, in life that kind of pointed towards fintech. So I was always excited about fintech. Um, I played board, our teacher made us play these weird board games in, in primary school that alerted me to the idea of running businesses. And then I discovered banking and capital reserve systems in high school, which led me to an interest in finances. And then I loved computers and taking them apart. So hardware became software. And so it was always FinTech for me. And so I always had this view that I wanted to do FinTech. However, sitting in Australia, there wasn't really the opportunity out of university, or at least I didn't think there was. Um, and so my path was always to try and learn how the best people in the world do it and then do it for myself. So I, I went to Silicon Valley to, to learn from uh, folks in the Valley, how to think, how to work, why it works. And then I wanted to bring it home to Southeast Asia uh, and build FinTech in Southeast Asia. So it's kind of the, the story arc to get us to Southeast Asia. And, and Zandit is, is really, you know, one of the first companies in C uh, that has raised from, you know, KPCB and, and Excel. And really, as everyone knows, um, these tend to be somewhat of, you know, selective uh, venture capital funds. What's, what's the story behind it? Yeah, great question. We have to rewind back to 2015 when this all happened. I, we were lucky to be the first Indonesian-focused business in YC, and I think within the first five Southeast Asian companies in YC. Um, and I think YC saw maybe before others the opportunity that Southeast Asia represents. From a macro perspective, you have this really large, I mean, it's the fourth largest country on earth in Indonesia, plus uh, much larger populations. You've got 50% of people under the age of 30, 120% phone penetration, which means the average person has more than one phone. And then smartphone penetration through the roof. You have some of the most active, I think still like Facebook and Twitter, the most active um, cities in the world are in Indonesia. So you have young, tech savvy population, but really poor infrastructure. And so that really attracted us to, to go home and go build something. Um, the micro was, we're from Southeast Asia and we wanted to uh, fix our countries and fix our economies to build the things that we need so that our economies can become uh, digital economies and, and service economies. So I think that excited us from a kind of personal perspective. Um, we launched a few different ideas and we pivoted during YC. And uh, I think on demo day, we were lucky to be coming out and presenting a product that had grown 16,000 users in six weeks. And that's when we met some of these characters in Excel and in KP. And I think for, I remember going up and down Sand Hill Road and a lot of time was explaining, um, where's Indonesia, is that in Bali? And trying to explain that um, yeah, I guess kind of uh, close enough uh, for their purposes. But I think these investors have, have a strong track record of seeing trends before others do, given the investments that they've made. And I think they saw, hey, this is someone that maybe can actually execute in the region, in a region where there's a rising tide or will be a rising tide. 
And so being able to get access to KP in Excel, I have to thank YC for that. I think without YC, none of these firms would have even taken a meeting with me. Um, but Excel have been with us since the seed round and they've been in every round since. They've been great supporters and they've really seen uh, our journey and helped us along it. So that's a story of how we got KP in Excel. And, and kind of alluding to this uh, point of you guys pivoting, right? Um, you had to pivot about three times approximately uh, to find PMF for your company. Can you tell us about some of the obstacles you faced during this process and kind of what you did to overcome this? Yeah, this is why I think YC is pretty helpful. We started out as a Bitcoin remittance company. We had this heart and idea. This is the first time Bitcoin was called um, to to build remittances that theoretically, you know, money moves across borders and it's frictionless and it, it kind of makes sense in theory. Uh, we actually started Send It by winning a, a Andreessen Horowitz sponsored hackathon between Berkeley and Stanford. And in that we demonstrated we could build an app that sent money from US to Indonesia. And we did that within 24 hours. So that was the idea we started with and we even managed to convince YC um, that that was a good idea. Or maybe they, they picked us rather than the idea, but uh, we thought it was a good idea, at least going into YC. Um, about halfway, we realized we actually weren't picking up the traction that we thought. There was three really important assumptions in the model um, that just didn't work, that didn't actually make sense. And those assumptions were wrong. So we pivoted halfway through. And that really was, I just remember that day I'd come back from Asia and it was a 12 minute conversation with Justin Khan. And we had said, hey, we're failing. Here's our numbers. It's not looking very good. Here's three ideas. And Justin Khan just saying at this 12 minute mark, hey, why don't you try build Venmo for Indonesia? Launch it in a week and see what happens. It was just so very, uh, yeah, so very casual in his statement. But we took it to heart and we launched a Venmo style product. And within six weeks, we got those 16,000 users. The second pivot we did was maybe four or five months later, as we, we'd gotten closer to like 160,000, maybe 180,000 users. And so it was growing quickly. Um, but I have this, I'd looked around the world and I had this thesis that to do e-wallets well, you really needed direct debit, ACH pool in the US. And that didn't exist in, in the markets we wanted to look at. So we figured, hey, let's go build the infrastructure uh, instead, rather than sink billions of dollars. Um, into uh, the consumer side. Uh, and so we pivoted for the second time. You asked about obstacles in each of those times. I think the first obstacle was we were just, we were just failing so bad. Uh, um, the main obstacle was kind of our own uh, morale to, to make sure that we just keep working hard and, and keep at it, even though we're failing. Uh, there wasn't an obstacle to change because we so, we're doing so poorly. The second one was a bit different in that from a vanity metrics point of view, we had 200,000 users and we were one of the first uh, e-wallets to market. If we'd kept growing, we'd probably be uh, one of the bigger folks now. So that one was a bit different, a bit of a different obstacle because we were ostensibly doing well. So I think for that one, it was more around really being able to understand why we think e-wallets work around the world and whether those dynamics uh, and assumptions exist in, in Indonesia. And uh, we didn't think it would, uh, ACH pool still doesn't exist in Indonesia. So you don't get the organic usage that you see in Korea or the US or in India. Uh, it's still very much subsidized, um, subsidized usage of e-wallets. Um, so I think that thesis actually worked out. It was just much harder to do because investors saw good numbers and then you suddenly say you're pivoting. So I think those were two different pivots, two different sets of obstacles that we faced. So I want to dive a bit deeper into this. You know, you talked about the two sets of obstacles that you faced, you know, at a high level uh, from the company perspective, you know, running, uh, you know, now a unicorn today, uh, such as Zendit. What are some of the internal obstacles that you have faced as a startup founder? A couple of things stand out to me. Um, I think I'm made for startups and that I didn't get too excited or, or too depressed. The kind of like the extremes of that emotional roller coaster are much more muted for me. Um, but I'm very well aware that people have bought into a mission and have entrusted us uh, or entrusted me to make decisions on their behalf. And they have families and kids to send to school. 
they also have a vision for what our country should look like going forward. So I think the the biggest obstacle is well, the biggest thing in my mind as we've gone through this the startup journey and, and through pivots is am I making the right decision that um, that's going to impact these people's uh, career trajectories, their lives and, and the outcomes for all of us. Um, and the first one was easier because it was just four of us. But the second one, we had a team of 20. And now that we have a team of closer to 500, um, it's, a, it's a much different game to make decisions that uh, have impacts at you know, eight figures or nine figures. Um, so I think that's the, the number one thing that comes to mind when you ask for kind of internal obstacles that hit. Um, the, maybe the second thing then that we really care about, don't know where to call it an obstacle, but as we build this organization, we care a lot about our people and our culture. So being able to, um, I, th I think a big obstacle or challenge and slash opportunity is figuring out how you want to construct your organization. There's lots of times where you can make short-term decisions that feel right in the moment or vindicate you in a moment, but uh, the wrong decision for the long run because you're demonstrating the wrong behavior or you're making a, a wrong decision on, on how things should be done at scale. And I think that's, uh, that's kind of the second biggest challenge once you kind of, once I get over myself and, and realize I just need to make decisions, then it's, hey, how do I make sure that I'm making uh, the right cultural decisions, the right example being set for the whole org? So those are things that stand out to me. So, so Moses, you know, the, the, the way I kind of like to see it, right, is, you know, as a, as a CEO of, you know, a company, right, you know, you're, you're always holding a plate in your hand, right? Um, and in this plate, there are three marbles, one marble being, you know, handling the investors, one being your clients, and one being your employees. When it comes to designing a, a company culture, how would, how does it kind of play a role in this company organizational structure? I'll speak to the plate analogy, which I quite like. In that, I think the organizational culture impacts all of those. From, I'll start internally with the company. That's probably the most obvious and we'll dive deeper into that. Uh, but obviously the culture you said affects your employees. Um, that has direct impact on customers because I think how you treat your own people uh, leads by example for how they'll treat our customers. Uh, the way we treat each other internally has direct impacts on uh, how quickly we reply, whether uh, we put we walk a mile in their shoes, um, and how quickly we respond and the kind of service that our customers get. Um, and then on investors, I think this, this, they're really part of the team, or they should be part of the team. And so the internal culture that we've built, I think, has big impacts on how investors see us and how they interact with us. Um, and that's also part of um, how we've purposely designed the org. So I'll, I'll jump into definitions of culture. Um, I really care about actionable definitions. There's lots of vague, amorphous, maybe intellectual definitions, uh, but I like definitions that I can action. So here's three that I really like. Culture is who you hire, who you fire, what you punish and what you incentivize. That's one. The second is culture is an extension of the leadership, the founders initially, and then the leadership afterwards. And then the third is culture is the operating system of the company. I'll speak to how each of these are really useful and actionable. The first, hire, fire, punish, and incentivize. Hiring is really obvious. We, we talk, people talk about that. Um, who the first 50 employees have a massive impact on, on what kind of culture attributes and decisions are made and what's celebrated and not going forward. Fire is one that we're probably most scared of doing, but we really need to do sooner. I've rarely met an entrepreneur who said, hey, I, I wish I fired that person later once I knew they should have been fired. Um, but it really sets a precedent for what we're willing to accept and what we're not willing to accept and setting an example to the org and making sure that you're actually fighting for the org rather than your own fear of conflict, um, I think sets the right tone. Then punish and incentivize, especially for us here in Asia, where uh, social um, social pressure relationships are so important. The, this idea of saving face that happens in Asia is really important. So what you celebrate in public, what you give awards for, what you note, what you write in, in letters to the organization, uh, what you 
incentivize and then what you punish, what you criticize in public has really big impacts for how people follow your example. Um, so you can think about every decision you make and everything you write in public and does this pursue the culture that I want to build. Um, the, the second definition then is culture is uh, an extension of, of the leadership. And I'll speak to the founder part, but there's been many times where I've seen an, an attribute or a behavior that I really don't like. And this kind of makes you do the, the stoic thing or the, maybe the right thing even and look in the mirror and say, what are you doing incorrectly? What are you leading by example in the wrong way? And there's definitely been times where uh, I've seen behavior that I don't like and I realize I'm the one exemplifying it. I'll give an easy one. I really hate gossip. I really hate people kind of talking about other people behind their back. Um, and this one time I saw it kind of within some of our senior people or people that work directly with me. And I was like, why is this happening? And I thought first thing I should do is check myself. And I noticed over two weeks, it may not be me explicitly, you know, talking about someone behind their back, but I noticed that I was doing little negs to people um, and little comments about people to others. And I realized, hey, if, if I'm allowed to do that behavior, then other people are observing that and probably copying it and, and maybe do it, taking it the next step. So I changed, um, I had to catch myself. And then I didn't say anything to anyone, but within a couple of months, I saw it kind of dissipate. So really actionable. The third one that I then like is this operating system. Think of it as, I think of it as different people at different applications and the operating system is the rules for how these applications interact with hardware and with each other. And so the operating system is really what, what people, product and process do we put in place in terms of how we make decisions and how we interact. So culture is what tools we have in place. What do we make it easy to communicate with? Are we synchronous, asynchronous as an org? Um, do we have no meeting Thursdays? Do we like all, all these little decisions that we make and how um, the org functions and how decisions can make drive certain cultural attributes, drive certain behavior. Uh, for example, we, uh, we were very particular around how we build regional teams. We do a bit different than others. Instead of having a headquarters in one country, we actually have uh, our product teams maybe um, headquarters in multiple different countries uh, by product team, and they will have people within that team from lots of the countries. That's not very efficient, uh, but we're solving for adaptability, not efficiency. And I think that's part of the operating system of how we choose to operate, uh, but has a huge impact on culture. For example, it's hard for someone to say, oh, those people in headquarters don't understand what we're doing because our product teams are headquartered locally, not in some central place. So there's examples of culture and how it impacts us. So kind of going off this, this uh, you know, cultural point, right? Um, in your opinion, what should, should a leader be doing or demonstrating when trying to generate an international culture? Yeah, there's some meta things and then there's some real practical things. I'll speak to a couple of these points. In terms of what like what a leader should be doing or demonstrating uh, for international, I think the most important hashtag maybe is empathy, uh, depending on which countries you need to operate in. Um, there's some great books about this, Culture Code, um, and useful frameworks. I'll, I'll just give a couple of frameworks that we use. The idea of a high context and low context culture um, high context being you can see situations and this is really applicable in places like Asia where right and wrong is really relative to the context in which you operate. Um, and you know, for us um, who might have grown up in, in Western country or, or Silicon Valley, uh, we rely on things like contracts to enforce, whereas in, in Southeast Asia, you rely on relationships to enforce. So something like the US, extremely low context culture, you just need a contract and people do what you say. Uh, and somewhere like Southeast Asia, contracts matter a lot less and relationships matter a lot more. When you have that, the understanding of, and there's a few different frameworks, but when you have an understanding of these frameworks and then you, I think, apply some empathy, uh, you, you can then really create um, the right kind of atmosphere to include both sides. So in our org, we have people from all over the world um, inside and we have people from I think 20-ish countries so we have to design a set of systems that work high context low context um, uh, and uh, that's 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 pretty difficult um, but something that we've decided to do is uh, to document 
uh, be really strong in documentation. This is pre-COVID, but we started as a distributed team. So we we're required to, to write documents. Um, and I'm an ex-consultant, so I love PowerPoint slides, but we actually made the choice to be more Amazon style and use six pages and documentation because it's easier for most people and harder to kind of BS. Um, so I think that's like one example of a, a meta framework or, or meta things that leaders should be doing is really understanding the like, through empathy, do empathy, so understand where people are coming from and then build something that makes sense for your business. Um, I'll do one more like little micro example of things um, to do. We made a choice early on to, to speak English as um, in our organization. A lot of Indonesian companies don't do that. Uh, I'd say we're in the minority, but we did that on purpose uh, because we wanted to be regional from day one. And we, I think we lost good talent that, you know, maybe uh, didn't speak English at the time. And there's some negatives to that definitely in the early days. But now that we roll regionally, we already have an organization where we've self-selected and or filtered for people that can work regionally really well. And we want people to be able to spread information. We don't want to have to rely on people to go to their managers and managers manager for information to go across the borders. We want the, the most frontline worker to be able to talk to the most frontline worker somewhere else. So uh, that's a small decision that we made, but really big impact uh, for how our culture works. And if we were to look at, you know, live by default versus live by design, how would I go about designing the culture I want for my team? Does that come from the top of the business? Uh, is that the boss's job? Uh, what is it in, in your opinion? I definitely think it starts, it starts with that founding team. I wouldn't say it's boss or not the boss, but the founding team is typically the founders. Um, but even your first 20 folks. And I think the decisions you make there really set the tone for culture into the next decade, likely. Um, and so with those three actionable definitions, we've thought about that. We've had those definitions since 2017, so maybe a year and a half into what we're doing. And uh, when, we see, when we see fruits, when we see activity and behavior that we like or don't like, uh, we go back to these three definitions and look what we want to change or what we want to incentivize. Um, you know, something that's a little bit different maybe than Silicon Valley. This is an always culture, but people sometimes point to uh, some of the behaviors. One of the behaviors that maybe a little bit weird for a Western audience, but we used to have uh, on, on someone's birthday, you'd get thrown into the pool. Um, and irrespective of age or title, you were thrown in. Uh, there's much, there's a video of a lot of people laughing as I'm throwing into the pool or some of our even more elderly um, colleagues were thrown in. And in this place like Asia where hierarchy is so important, age is so important, it's so rare to see that. Um, and so I think that's an example where we're very purposeful around, okay, interesting behavior may or may not work in, in another context. Uh, but for us, uh, it, it, said a few things one it said hierarchy is not important it said age is not important it said taking oneself too seriously um we don't want people to take themselves too seriously and so it was this kind of salute to um, meritocracy um in in one small behavior so as we and that i will say wasn't started by a leader that was started very much bottoms up but we made really conscious decisions around behaviors that we sort of say, do we promote this or do we stop this? Um, there's definitely lots of behaviors that we stopped around. Uh, you've heard me talk about gossip previously. I really, really hate gossip. So wherever we see that or sense that we try to stamp it out. Um, so I think there's a, yeah, those are some examples of like defaults, people doing things and then it just kind of becomes part of the legend and part of tradition of what people do. But really designing and nudging to say, okay, you know, this kind of, it's kind of like pruning a, a plant. It's like this thing happens, but do we cut it off or do we let it grow? And you live by the principles. You can really design an organization that matches um, what you're trying to accomplish. And when it comes to looking at this kind of uh, horizontal versus uh, vertical approach, right? Where in startups, horizontal would be in, you know, come from the sense where, you know, everyone kind of acts like their own CEO, 
what would you recommend to founders out there? And what, what do you guys personally use? I feel like from what I've kind of heard throughout this podcast, uh, it's, it's more horizontally driven, but uh, I'll leave that to you to answer. I think most companies would like to pretend they're horizontally dif- driven. They'll definitely say it in, in marketing. Uh, the way we model ourselves is I spent a short time at Amazon and a lot of YC growth businesses um, seem to seem to follow some version of Amazon ideals. Maybe a lot of founders come from Amazon or definitely I know some of the influencers and CEOs I look up to um, spent time at Amazon. And then Amazon, they've... Jeff Lawson, CEO of Twilio, captures this in his book, Ask Your Developers. But he talks about how Amazon at 500 and 2,500 and 25,000 felt similar to a lot of people. So they'd successfully created this culture of teams of teams or, or a conglomerate of startups. And so that's something I admire and, and we've tried to build in our org. So with a horizontal vertical, I definitely say we have some veto rights. And so there's definitely some vertical nature to what we do. But I realize that vertical doesn't scale. Um, the Roman Empire is maybe a good example of that. Uh, but if you can build a culture of, uh, if you can build an organization culture, if you can build an org where um, people in their domain with the highest context are given ability to make decisions and you have a bench of general managers who can step into these, these domains with maybe very little knowledge, but then be able to ramp up quickly and make the right general manager decisions, you can actually scale in a much bigger way in a much more decentralized way. And I think Amazon's done that really, really well. Um, the way they set up the teams, whether it's within retail or AWS, um, you, you see that um, principle at work. So we've tried to do the same thing where we put GMs to own their own product lines and business lines and then run it. Uh, they're accountable for the outcome. Uh, might be 10% month to month growth, 30% month to month growth, whatever it is. Uh, they're given the tools and resources to make it happen. Um, but that's very different than uh, I think most startups, especially Southeast Asian startups, which are basically the cult of the founder. And you see that in the way they write stories is everything's about the founder and the cult of the founder. I think for us, we, uh, we try really hard to make sure that it's not about a particular person making the decisions, but it's decentralized into those with the most context uh, to make the right localized decisions. So Moses, in, in June of 2020, you wrote this very interesting uh, blog post uh, titled Thoughts on Mentors. Can you walk us through your two to five to 10 year three and, and what that is? Sure. I have to credit my mom a little bit for demonstrating this to me. She didn't articulate it in this way, but I adopted it and ran and uh, adapted it. Um, in high school, I was doing uh, debating and she was very good at getting me uh, people who are tutors who are a couple of years ahead who had succeeded and were able to kind of give me really practical advice um, so that, you know, in English as a second language kid could end up doing okay in public speaking and debating. Um, but she gave me a very clear guide and it was demonstrated that having a mentor a couple of years ahead of you in whatever field you want to excel in was really helpful because they remembered what it was like and they could give you really practical things, simple things like how do you write a speech when it's impromptu or how do you answer this kind of topic in debate because that's topical at the time. Um, very kind of throughout university, I then wanted, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur but I didn't know what it took to get there. And those two years ahead of me were still in banking and consulting and that wasn't very useful. Um, and so I added two more to the list. So I have this theory now around two, five and 10 years. The, the two year ahead mentors can help you with the practical things. The five year ahead mentors uh, are, are able to still remember the times, uh, but they're a little bit more high level and they can tell you, hey, how do I, how do I get to maybe in a startup case, it's maybe a series C. Like how do I, what do I need to get right in the A so that I can get to the series C? The 10 plus year ahead mentors were those who'd just seen so much in life that they were able to kind of pattern recognition around situations and then apply it to yours. My favorite example here was Rob Chandra, who is a mentor of mine, passed away now, unfortunately, but he was on the Forbes Midas list five times. He was an adjunct at, at Cal where I met him. But he'd just seen so many situations in the startup world and VC world 
that whatever whatever situation I was in and brought him, he could say, hey, this is what we did when we sold to Apple. This is what we did when uh, we invested in this company. This is what this billion dollar fintech did when they were in the same situation. Just good pattern recognition. And his advice was the only one that I know that was probably maybe hit rate of 99% correct. So having this two, five and 10 year group of mentors has been really helpful to me to really path. Okay, what do I do tomorrow? That's two years. What do I need to worry about maybe three months from now so that I'm set up correctly for the next couple of years? That's a five year mentor. And then how do I make sure that I make the right decisions in really weird situations, very special situations where I don't get to see it every day? For example, fundraising, and that's a 10 year mentor. So that's two, five and 10 and how it helps me. And to really wrap up our call with our last question today, uh, Moses, you've had such a fascinating background uh, from Deloitte to, you know, BCG to Amazon to, you know, founding a few startups before Zendit. And in your opinion, what piece of advice would you give to people out there from the journey you have had so far in life? This reminds me, I actually have a, a deck, PowerPoint deck with I uh, use internally where I call it Silicon Valley frameworks. And it includes a summary of all the frameworks I learned in Silicon Valley that I think are actionable and changed my life. Um, and that we implement it, send it every single day. I'll pick one from there that I think maybe applies to those aspiring to be entrepreneurs or those early along in their careers or those just young at heart. Um, this is a mix of YC, Justin Kahn, and, and my own thoughts put in together. But the, I have this function for success. So success equals some function of luck, smarts, and work ethic. I'll go through each element and, and how I think it's practical. The first part is luck. I think so many people have success bias and confirmation bias about their own journeys. Um, yes, most people that succeeded work hard, but uh, there's a bunch of luck involved. Simple things like the family I was born into. I was born in Southeast Asia, which now matters in the world. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably have access to things that m the majority in the world don't have access to. And so that's just a function of luck. And I think that applies in startup world too. Uh, I'm lucky to be born in the right time from the right place so that we can build payments infrastructure before anyone else has built payments infrastructure. So that's a luck, not in our control. The part that is in our control is that this is a different quote, but you, you can generate chances at luck by work ethic. So I, I like that theory that you, the harder you work, the more chances you get to roll the dice. The second part of that function then is smarts. And smarts for us has some asymptote. Um, I love soccer, but as much as I practice soccer, even if I practice 24 seven, I'll still never be as good as Cristiano, Cristiano Ronaldo or Lionel Messi. There's just an asymptote to my smarts in that area. Um, and there's an asymptote to starts in whatever area we choose to function in. But I can approach that asymptote. I can get real close to the asymptote by spending time in that area, in that industry, or in that function. And spending time and, and, uh, is work ethic to me. The third part then is work ethic, which is out of the three, really the only thing in my control. Um, Luck, I don't have 100% control over. Smarts, I don't have 100% control over. But work ethic and how much I apply myself, I definitely um, have control over. And so here's the practical implications that I really like. Um, one is be grateful for the luck you have. I think there's some stoicism here, but being able to reflect and be like, you know what? Not everyone has the same luck and, I'm, and I don't need to compare myself to others. I just need to say, did I try my best? Um, be grateful for what we have and work hard given the talents that we've been given. So that's one. Two is that I really don't measure my success anymore by what others see or what others perceive. Um, I realize that other people have different things than me, different starting points, different, different ending points. And so I measure myself instead on how much effort did I put in and did I really do my best? And if I did my best, then I'm going to be happy with that, whatever the result. And I think that results in a more grateful, happy person. So I think, uh, and then the third part is work ethic is all that matters. So that's kind of documented well in startups, but uh, work your ass off and maybe you'll get somewhere. 
So I really like this definition because it has really practical implications for how you live your life. You can be happy. Uh, you can be grateful for what you have, but you can also slog yourself to death uh, knowing that um, you're, you're having a go at something you really want to do and, and in some small way change the world. So that's the advice I'd give to myself yeah, if I was coming out of university or just, just kind of starting in my career. To do great things, you have to just be a bit crazy. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Agree. Maybe a similar quote is like, um, there's a quote around the only crazy people can change the world, um, which which I like. I think you have to a little be a little bit crazy. Crazy define I have beholder, but I think part of craziness is the audacity to imagine things bigger, uh, which I think is the is the first thing that I had to fix coming into the valley. I think I was thinking way too small. Um, and then the craziness part is being obsessed, being crazily obsessed about something and putting in the work ethic so you have chances at luck so that you can approach the asymptote of smarts and so that you can um, try to build something that matters. So yeah, I, I think that that quote makes a ton of sense. And Moses, for people who are interested in uh, reaching out to you or potentially catching a cup of coffee with you down the line, uh, what would be the best point of contact? Sure. Uh, my email is moses at sendit.co, uh, just first name at. Uh, feel free to email me. Tell me tell me where you heard about this from. So if you put in the in the subject title, Geeks of the Valley podcast, then I know it's not spam. There's a lot of spam these days. So put that in and I'll know how you heard about it. And uh, I, I try to make time. I'm have this personal mission to, and I get great joy out of um, bringing people up through the process. Uh, I'd send it internally. We talk about the send it mafia, this idea taken straight from the PayPal mafia, but just as PayPal's first few employees and, and early folks managed to build billion dollar businesses post PayPal, I want the same thing for us. And I want to be that pioneer in the region. So one data point I have is that two Senate alums have gone through YC. And in 2015, just five years ago, there were zero Indonesian companies in YC. So we've come a long way in, in a short time. But I'm just passionate about making that happen and making the path easier for others. So ping me. Moses, it was a pleasure to have you on Geeks of the Valley. And thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. 